Christ has risen. The he Lord is here. Risen now I didn't hear anybody at home saying that the right way. Remember, it's Christ is risen, and you answer, He is risen indeed. So let's try it again. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen. risen indeed. That sounds a lot better. Everybody at home sounded good joining us in that. Let's start today with a prayer. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us the opportunity to come together and worship. We now ask you now to fill our hearts. Let us feel your presence. Let us know that you are here with all of us as we worship in our separate buildings. We ask in your son's name. Amen. Let's sing together one verse of Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Dreams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me song, melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the count I fixed upon it. Mount of the gather together today, we're reminded that we will be doing this sort of worship for at least two more weeks. With the governor's state of emergency through May the 16th, our bishop has said no churches will meet until after May the 13th. So we know that at least this Sunday, next Sunday, and Mother's Day Sunday will all be video services. So remember to join us for each of those. Right now, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we have so many things going on in our lives. We wonder, why does it keep going? Why can't we have some, some set, something settled somewhere, some ease? There's so much anxiety, so much uncertainty. And yet, Lord, you are the rock. You are the thing that is always there. So help us to lean upon you, to trust you, and to sit in your presence and know that you care. We ask you now to be with everyone in our, our, our congregation, all our members, wherever they may be. Give them peace and security this week. Give them safety. Let them feel your presence. And Father, we ask you to forgive us all of our sins. Forgive us the things said and done, things left unsaid, left undone. Forgive us every time we break our fellowship with you. And now we ask that you would be with us through the rest of this service, that we may feel your presence. For we ask in your son's name. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from John 21, verses 1 through 14. John chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Afterward, Jesus appeared to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the other side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of a large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he'd taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. 
This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we look at the details of this scripture, we see that the disciples are just waiting around, biding their time, just like Jesus told them to do. They're waiting for that power on high to come upon them. They're waiting as Jesus told them. But how long do they have to wait? We know Jesus first appeared to his disciples on Easter evening when Thomas was absent, and then eight days later when Thomas was present. And now they're still waiting. But like most of us, they get impatient. They get tired of waiting for Jesus, and Peter decides to go fishing. Now, going fishing is not just picking up a cane pole with a hook, a line, cork, a lead sinker, and dig up a worm or two. Going fishing meant going back to the trade of commercial fishermen. It meant going back to that which Peter, Andrew, James, and John had done before they met and followed Jesus. Maybe they're giving up and reverting to their old ways. Maybe they simply wanted a little money while they waited for Jesus. Maybe they were just antsy and needed something to do. Have you ever been like that? Have you ever grown tired of waiting for God to do something so you decided to take it into your own hands. One of the classic examples from the Bible is the story of Abraham and Ishmael. God had promised to make Abraham a father of a great nation. But Sarah was not able to have children, and so Abraham was not willing to continue and wait and wait and wait for Isaac, who would be God's answer. So Abraham fathered Ishmael through Sarah's maid, Hagar. Abraham got tired of waiting, and he decided to take matters into his own hands. But as a result of Abraham's impatience and lack of faith and trust in God, we now have the Arab-Israeli conflict between the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Isaac. You see, when we go our own way, when we go alone and do things our way instead of God's way, we run into problems. And that's exactly what happened to the fishermen in our story today. These men are commercial fishermen. They knew the water, they knew the fish, they knew how to fish. On the Sea of Galilee, the fishermen used large nets to catch the fish. And because the water is very shallow, they fish at night so that the fish won't see the shadows of the net. But this time they worked all night, throwing the net out, dragging it back in, and every single time it was empty. They were tired, they were disappointed. Perhaps they felt as though nothing would ever go right again. Jesus was gone. He'd left them alone to face their family and friends. He'd left them alone to explain what had happened. And now they couldn't even go back to their own livelihood of catching fish. They fished all night and still had nothing to show. Weariness and discouragement had set in. As dawn breaks after a long night of fruitless work, Jesus appears on the beach. Of course, the disciples don't know who he is. But when he asks them if they catch any fish and they reply the negative, he tells them to throw their net out on the other side of the boat. Now, we don't know why they followed his advice. What difference would one more toss make? I mean, it's daylight now. What difference would one side of the boat rather than the other side of the boat? But for some reason unknown to us and perhaps also unknown to them, they threw the net out one more time. And this time, the catch was so great that the net was bulging. And the instant that the disciples recognized Jesus, Peter grabs his clothes, jumps into the water, and heads to the shore as quickly as he can. Now, it's not as easy as it sounds. I was there in the place where they believed that this happened, and it is no nice sandy beach. The ground is covered with rocks, rocks about the size of your fist, and it's hard to walk, let alone be able to run ashore. But on the beach, Jesus is there, he has the fire going, and he has some of his own fish. And he asked the disciples to add some of their own to the fire. Their net was full, they had 153 great big fish. They'd followed the instructions of Jesus and they'd caught a full night's worth of fish. He met them where they were. He saw their need and he met that need just as he does for us today. He meets us where we are physically, he meets us where we are spiritually. But to stop there, I think we miss an important part of this story. In order to catch the fish, 
The disciples had to do what Jesus told them to do. It required action and commitment on their part. You see, love requires a commitment, and God requires a commitment from us. He's willing to meet us where we are, to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, but he requires that we act in obedience to him. If we want to see the saving power of Jesus at work in our lives, we have to submit our lives to him. We can't be born again. We can't be turned into a new creation if we're unwilling to allow him to work in us. You know, we like to be the ones who call all the shots. But God doesn't play that way. It's his game. We are his creation. And we play by his rules. There's no room for selfish, self-centered interest and for God in our lives. The Bible tells us we can't have divided interest. It's either all God or it's no God. It says you can't serve God and mammon both. So the Lord comes to you today. And he says, throw out your net on the other side of the boat. What are you going to do? Are you going to patiently explain to him why that's not practical? Are you going to try to justify what you're doing, the way you're doing it? Are you just going to pretend that you didn't hear him when he called? Or are you going to throw your net out on the other side of the boat? You see, it's your choice. But God can only work with you if you are willing. So the question that we're all left with today is are you willing to allow God to have your life? Are you willing to allow God to have your life? Will you join me in singing, Take My Life and Let It Be? Take my life and let it be. the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.